All right, welcome along to the RT Soccer Podcast. Raf Giallo here alongside Ed Leahy of RT Sport Online. And we're also joined by Graham Gartland and Ollie Cahill to take us through the finer points of Shamrock Rovers' Europa Conference League campaign. We're into the second week and also there's plenty of action in the SSC or Tristy League. And then we are going to talk about Liverpool at the end as well because we have Champions League coverage this week when they take on Ajax and look to bounce back from the defeat to Napoli last week. But... Before we start all that, Ed, there is the Women's World Cup playoff draw. So Ireland, of course, last week had made up, made their way into the second round of the playoffs, but it's ended up being quite a convoluted draw process. Yes, it certainly was. Um, it wasn't immediately clear, but as it turned out, um, it, 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 it appears uh, that it was all legit and that Ireland... Have been handed in a way draw, um, and they'll have to go and play either Scotland in Scotland or in Austria to see who uh, who progresses. I won't say they'll definitely get through to the World Cup if they win that game because, as, as you know, there's an other issues up at stake there and at play. But um, overall, I think you can't be unhappy with where you are at this stage of the whole process like going into the whole qualifying campaign being in the group with sweden and finland you know the old cliche of if you offered vera this scenario she would certainly have taken it um i think it's going to be interesting to see that game between scotland and austria to see what you're up against vera paints two completely different pictures of the teams in in in, in waiting for her you know obviously she, she's extremely um familiar with the Scottish setup because having been there for I think six years she spent uh, as the Scottish manager and um, so she would obviously keep it an eye on that scenario while she was very complimentary towards the Austrians having watched them and analysed them during the recent uh, European championships so you know it's a hard she wouldn't she really wouldn't let her guard down as to where she fancied going or what she fancied doing uh, I think personally, she likes the idea of going back to Scotland to sort of show maybe where she where she was and where she is now and how she's got on. But you know, perhaps that a, a trip to Austria might just take the emotion out of it and bring it back down to a game of football. And that one perhaps is the one most most uh, attractive for the, from an Irish perspective. Yeah, let's listen to Vera Pau now. She's speaking to Tony O'Donoghue at the press conference on Friday after the draw was made. It's a tough one, eh? It's a very tough draw. Um, both Scotland and Austria are really good teams. Um, and Austria in the Euros has impressed me hugely. I had, um, uh, I've done one of their games um, for RTE. And um, yeah, they, they are well organized, physically strong, a few extremely good, uh, talented players. Um, a strong striker, a solid defense. So um, if they get through, it will be very, very difficult. But the same like Scotland. Uh, we all know um, how much experience they have, how dynamic they play um, with players uh, like Kim Little in it. And uh, we have huge, um, yeah, huge respect for them. So um, it could have been better, but we have to do we have to deal with it we have to go for it and uh, we will we will be ready on the 11th of october okay so 11th of, of, of october obviously which is the second round of the playoffs um as you said scotland take on austria first in that first round when she says it could have been better is that more in reference to the fact it could have been wales or bosnia who switzerland have got yeah i think she she did she referenced uh, the other like she referenced um, Switzerland and Iceland, as because we are also watching their results. So she referenced the two of them, and she does seem to think that that would have been the easier draw. But it also, she sort of also makes the point that um, because of the Iceland game, she sort of probably fancies that they may not uh, go through. And obviously, there's a scenario where if they if they go through on penalties and Ireland in 120 minutes they will uh leapfrog Iceland in the in this seeding table which would put them through to the World Cup automatically so yeah I think it could have been easier but obviously um ahead of that Slovakia game where they had to win it not knowing if they would have a, a second seed and uh, to be second seed in the in in, in this in this phase or so, sorry to be in the second phase of it um I think it's a lot easier than it could have been at this stage. 
Yeah, and there are injuries though, of course, Rusha Littlejohn among them. Yes, yeah, and she like she's a very um I suppose unsung hero of the team, I think. When because Denise and Katie get so much attention, um Rusha's role isn't as 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 hyped as much, but it, it's it's an incredible um She's an incredible midfielder there. She can really read the game well and she she is a really good link between the defence and, and the forwards. But the, there appears to there appears to be options in that team now. Um and in the squad you, you could see with, with 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 the recent games where players have been slotting in seamlessly. So that's what Vera's been building over the last few years as well as building a winning team. She's been building the squad. And that's that's happening. Um, obviously, there's an issue as well. Well, a potential issue with Heather Payne um, getting released from the American college system, which Vera has all has always been critical of. But um, it, I don't think they're too concerned about uh, Heather's availability for this one. Yeah. So we'll see on October 6th when what happens between Scotland and Austria. And then, of course, uh, Ireland will be watching that very closely ahead of October 11th. And again, with that convoluted process, as you said, it's not necessarily going to be clear until all the matches are over on the 11th which two teams go straight to the World Cup and obviously which team then has to go through the kind of rigmarole of playing in the further playoff round against teams from other confederations. But what is clear is the Europa Conference League group stages where Shamrock Rovers opened up their group stage campaign with a nil-nil draw at home to Urgoran last Thursday. Uh, Oli Cahill, um, obviously you've avoided the the whole Garth Brooks thing over, over the weekend, but uh, more importantly, your own view on that match at Tallah Stadium. Your, I suppose your, your view before the match and then how it played out and how do you feel Shamrock Rovers did in the end and how happy or not Stephen Bradley will be? Yeah, uh... I think they're probably happy to an extent, but they probably feel like they might have left the win behind as well. Um, they kind of grew into the game, but look, I suppose they're, they're building up that experience over the last number of years playing playing in Europe. And, you know, I suppose there was a certain amount of feeling each other out the first game in the group. You certainly don't want to lose, especially at home. Um, so, but you could see they had a few chances. Um, they could have got ahead and, you know, it was, and then obviously your gardens came at, came at them again towards the end as well. So I suppose overall probably happy enough with the draw. Um, so even tinged probably with a little bit of disappointment, but look with the other game finishing nil nil as well, I suppose no ground lost on any, on any of the other teams. So it'll, it's, it's all to play for. And, um, you know, they'll, I think they'll be quietly confident and just, you know, talking to some of the players and stuff over the last number of weeks, I think, their aim is to get out of the group. They're not just there to make the numbers up or to be, you know, maybe grab a win or a point here and there because, you know, the, the financial um, implications of that. But they're looking to, you know, progress, which is which is great for an Irish team in the group stages of any um, European competition to be looking and, and thinking like that. Yeah, and Graham, you know, home form is always going to be key to how Shamrock Rovers do. And when we look at the stats, I mean, 49% possession, five shots on target to Eurogoran's tree. And, uh, you know, when you look at the overall shots, it's more or less the same. And it was a game really in the balance. Obviously, Eurogoran at the beginning seemed to, you know, they, they seemed to be putting the pressure on. But then Shamrock Rovers were able to take the sting out of it and had their own chances as well. Yeah, 100%. Your Gardens came out firing on all cylinders. They moved the ball around really well. Ericsson was really influential at, at the start of the game, even with some of his set-piece deliveries that were fantastic. Um, and then Rovers sort of got a grips of it a little bit. They got closer. They got uh, tighter in midfield. They pushed up a little bit more. They were able to get more pressure on the ball. And when they won it back then, they were in better areas to try and attack. Um like you're right, the, your your gardens finished probably the game a little bit stronger as well. And sometimes in these, I think the difference with the with these group games compared to the the two legged ones is it's it's three points are up for grab. It's not a case of having a two legged affair where you where you can play and then if you lose one nil, you know well we can have a go with them at home. If you lose one nil, you basically don't get three points. So you could see that change in mentality a little bit where. I think Stephen set the team out really well. There was times to drop back into a back five. Uh, and as, and against good teams, sometimes you have to suffer for five or ten minutes and allow them to have the ball. But once it's in front of you, and like I said, I thought Rovers done 
nearly a lot of facets of the game. They done it really, really well. They counter attacked when they should. They kept the ball well when they should. They defended in numbers when they should. And uh, I agree, they were probably unlucky not to come away with a one 0 win from the period from half time till about the seventy fifth minute. Um, Rovers were excellent. They were on the front foot. They moved the ball really well. They got chances over the top for um, Green and Gaffney a couple of times as well. Uh, Johansson, the right back for um, your gardens started to look a little bit shaky in possession and coughed up a couple of chances as well. So um, they're a good side. I was speaking to Glenn Cronin yesterday. He said they're a really good side. And it was a proper game of football where it ebbed and flowed, where there was, there was spells of possession for each team, there was spells of pressure for each team. Um, and, and again, it was a really interesting game of football to watch. Um, one of the interesting things, of course, was the selection Stephen Bradley made at the beginning with Justin Ferzai getting the what I would regard as a huge vote of confidence in a game of that stature to 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 go in from the start. Obviously, we've seen him, we've seen little cameos from him uh, earlier in the season, also in the European campaign. But uh, what have you made of his development and the potential you can see in him? Um, I think he's gone in. I think he's broke into the team through his hard work and his ability and his technical ability to take the ball into his spaces. Where, where I see the improvement in Justin from when he was younger was he dribbled a lot when he was younger. He, he he would he would dribble a lot with the ball and go through gaps and he can go both ways. And and it's great to do that when you're 13, 14, and fifteen because you can see it in the in the game now we can get out to his spaces really well. But what he has also brought to the game is his ability to play one or two touch and touch spaces. And I can see that with the with the senior players, they trust them with the ball now. It's a big thing for, for senior players to trust 17-year-olds and punch the ball into them. And they know that, you know what, he might take two touches and give it back to me or he might roll out and play a true ball. So his development in, in that, his game understanding is a lot better. He also, was ne- he also needed to work on when he lost the ball, his reactions to losing the ball have been better. He gets back into shape more. He um he knows where he needs to be defensively on the pitch, and again Stephen and Glenn would have worked them worked them on that as well because that was something that as a youth team player you can get away with sometimes, but at that level at European level you won't get away with not being in a good shape because you get picked off. But this the kid has abundance of confidence. It's this you're saying that the world a world of good for his confidence. His, his confidence is already uh, ridiculous. He, he he backs himself in a good way. Um, I remember he was walking by training one day, and I said, "Do you want to come in and talk to our group?" And it, like, and one of the things I said, "What would you say to the, to the group? Uh, you were fourteen. What would you say to this group?" Um, and he just basically said, "Believe in yourself." And I thought it was great because most people would say, "Oh, work hard," but he says, "Make sure you believe in yourselves and what you're doing." And I said, "Fair play to him." And it's somebody, like I said, these nights he just gets excited by it. Nothing. Uh, European nights wouldn't face wouldn't face Justin at all. Yeah, it's huge though, isn't it? For a, like for a seventeen year old like that, you're thinking with the European games, I'll play some of the league games, maybe, you know, and and bed him in there. But you know, I'm saying if he's if he's full of confidence himself, for the manager to give you to show that sort of confidence in you to throw you into that game, like that should give you a lift as well. And like I, there's no doubts looking at him. He's well able to handle it. Takes it all in his stride. And you know, if he keeps going the way he's going. Like he can go wherever he wants to really, and if he has that attitude that Graham's describing, that's that's great to hear as well. Yeah, you know, like it brings it, it brings a joy, it brings a joy to the game. Like you see, even Ollie, like Ollie's talking about him there, and he's smiling about him because everybody likes to see young players. It's just it's just the potential that makes you smile because you, you maybe in four years' time he's doing that for Ireland as well if he keeps going on the trajectory he's on. But that's what it's like when you're in the stadium and he picks up the ball. You can feel everybody just. Jeez, he's only seventeen, and he, and it's brilliant, and it's a it, it lifts everybody around the club. What I was going to say was just um, it was interesting on on his uh, sort of status and within the squad now. Um, afterwards, you know, there was there was questions to Stephen in the press conference, like you know, oh, squad selection that was a bit of a bit of a gamble playing your you know picking certain t- players with Jack on the bench with you know with experience on the bench and Stephen was just like there was no injury concerns it was this is this is squad rotation I trust every single one of these players and he was he wasn't making any sort of you know oh I wanted to wrap Jack up for another week or so he was this was this is my squad and, and Justin is very much part of it and if you if you notice in the game um the, the first 10 minutes which is 
becoming a bit of a, a habit for Rovers in these European games now. Uh, they got out of it essentially by, by Justin getting on the ball and holding on to the ball. And just there was a lot of little one touch passing up the left side there and just in around the midfield, which just sort of eased the, eased the pressure on the, on the defence for a few minutes. And then, as, as it happened, the rest of the team sort of grew into, grew into the game as well. So he, he played a vital role on Thursday, not just being on the pitch. Like I said to you, his ability to take the ball and put in toy spaces is, 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 is excellent. And he's, he's technically really gifted off both feet. And, and we, we, we hear a lot of coaching and all these coaching now as well. Take your touch on your back foot and stuff. So sometimes it's hard to do that as a midfielder because it's not always possible. Justin has the ability to go outside uh, uh, with each side of his foot, outside of his left, outside of his right, and then check. But he will then keep possession and, and come around the front of players and, and collect the ball. But um, he, he demands the ball off people in a good way. And, and he's willing to, to absorb that pressure of, of of taking a touch and touch spaces and be willing to give it to him. And like you said, he's he, he's training every day with these lads. He's training around the likes of Jack Bourne and Graham Bork, who are similar in that they they want the ball in tight spaces. Um, and because they they have a picture of where they want to go. So if you're giving it to me, they're already looking for the next pass. So you just drop it for them. They might play one around the corner and we follow it because these players can see things that other players can't, especially someone like probably myself. So uh, I'd uh, I'd more likely just be passing the ball to them if I could. Can I just ask Graham um, about that opening 10 minutes, Graham? Um, the amount of experience the team have built up so far in the competition, in, in, I suppose, this season in Europe, combined with the amount of research they would have done before the game. And yet still, there's that little element of, of of nerves at the start. Now, Stephen said afterwards it was just down to negative passing in the first 10 minutes. From a defender's perspective, is there almost a need for those first few minutes to just see what, what you're up against? Or how, like, what, what, what was your take in the first 10 minutes? Um, is it just experience that, that they'll, they'll build on? It's like anything. You can watch all the videos you want, and and Ollie and who's had a record. Ollie has a ridiculous amount of appearance in Europe as well. And we would watch videos like of all the teams you're going to play and dissect them and do our homework on them. And even then, when you still turn up to play them, it's still that oh, because a video won't show you what strength this a person has when when it's you that's hitting them. I might show you the strength of when a different player is hitting them or won't show you the speed they have compared to yourself. So it's that initial 10 minutes of feeling how these players move, uh, how strong they are, how physical they are, what their, what their pre-movements are before they want to receive the ball, how quick they pass the ball. They play a, diff, they play a flat tree in midfield, which is something that um, Stephen would have known, but it's not something the players come up against that often. So it's adjusting to that as well. But that's what Stephen's saying. You can see the change in them when Stephen starts saying, listen, pass forward, punch the ball forward, get Gary O'Neill on the ball and get him punching forward to the two. Rovers obviously play with two tens, play with that box in midfield. But th- there is always that element of, not surprise in terms of, but that element of the unknown about how these players move, how they feel, how strong they are, how actually quick they are when you get to play against them. And that's something that we even found out playing in Europe. I think we played HJK Helsinki one year and we were looking at them thinking, ah, oh, they're not too bad. The video probably was a bit slower than <laughs> back then. The VHS wasn't moving as well. But um, I remember then we walked out and I'm thinking, oh my God, <laughs> these are unbelievable. Like, And there was a lot of front and Paul highlighted them. He said, look, it doesn't look great. Knee bandage on, doesn't move well. But he kept saying, he's a player. I'm telling you, he's a player. And he he absolutely ripped us for about 15 to 20 minutes in Daily Mount one the, for the first goal. And he gave you a show of quality that you probably sometimes miss on a video. So um I but I think Rovers done well in that they, they made sure they just defended well and weathered that little bit of a storm that your gardens brought for the first 10 minutes. And it's something they probably are learning in Europe as well, Ed, because away against Luda Koretz and against Ferdinand Farnish, they had conceded early goals. So for this case, they haven't. And the record at home this season is is brilliant. They're unbeaten at home in all competitions. And you can see that when, when Tala gets up and running, um, Rovers are a formidable, a formidable outfit. Yeah, and then Ghent uh, on Thursday, 5.45pm kickoff um, in Belgium. 
that's probably on paper going to be the toughest game Shamrock Rovers is going to play in this group, at least because given the away the away factor, and they're also a pot one team. So, Ollie, is it a case of, as Graham has said there, obviously lessons learned from Fern Chavaros and Luda Goretz away from home that they need to be compact for as long as possible? Yeah, absolutely. I think they're. That'll be the one thing they'll probably look back on on the European run is the, that those away games and certain even spells in the away games that have cost them the toys overall. And um, knowing they were away first, as you say, in Ferenc Farras and Ludogorets and up against the coming home with those score lines, you know. But like the lesson learned from, like say that the Euro Gardens game, they were under a little bit of pressure, but they saw it out and they didn't concede. So um, you know they're learning all the time, and that's. I think that's that's something that most teams, when you're going away, go, let's keep it nice and compact, nice and tight, um, see how we get on, and then you grow into the game and gradually, and as, as Graham was speaking about there, you get a feel for the team and the game, and you go, actually, do you know what? We can up the pace a bit here. We can we could get at these, or then it might be a case of, no, we just need to sit in. We need everyone at it here, and we might nick one from a set piece or something, because Rover still have quality going forward. They have players that can score goals and that, that can open teams up, and you know, if, if again or any team underestimated them, they'll they'll be able to exploit that. I, I've no doubt about that. But you know, these these are a decent outfit. I think they topped their group last season as well in the in the in the conference league. And I think Partizan were were in that group. Um, and they got knocked out by Pauk in the end, who, who beat Bowles. Like so, these are decent. These will be decent. It'll, it'll be a tough game. But again, look, if Rovers go out there and play the way we know we can play, I think they can get something out again. Yeah, and they play a system not too dissimilar to Shamrock Rovers, but a 3 4 1 2 generally, apart from I think their first round uh, or their first matches in Europe this season where they went 4 2 3 1. But yeah, as you said, they have a bit of pedigree. They were in the Champions League last 16, six years ago, and they won the Belgian League in 2015, and they're the reigning Belgian Cup win- winners uh, as well. And we know the strength of the, the Belgian League at the moment, though, mixed start to the season. They did win yesterday against Sult Farragam, but uh, a 2-0 win, which puts them up to fifth. And in terms of players and that to look out for, Hugo Kuypers scored yesterday. Um, he has five goals in eight league games to start the season and he scored 13 um, last season as well. And then they've uh, their captain, Vadis Ojija Ofo as well, who plays sort of in that 10 role as well. But uh, Graham, as you know, you kind of said before, you know, sometimes, you know, video will only show you so much and you can throw out names and, you know, systems and things. But again, it's going to be a case of, I guess, Shamrock Rovers necessarily not showing any fear, but also showing uh, a level of compactness. Yeah, exactly. It's the distances. I, I, um, the Fairhouse Farish game when they were away from home. I think there was the distances between the 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 distance between the striker and the back line was just too big, and it meant that the midfield never got in touch with the back line, um, and the gaps were just too big. And and I'm speaking to Stephen, it was something that he fixed for the home leg where. I think Gary O'Neill ended up being a little bit more tighter to his back three, but the back three also squeezed up an extra five or ten yards as well, which stops that gap that allows the tens or the the, the, the strikers to drop in and play. I seen it with uh, the other night with Gary O'Neill and McCann came back in and played in that. So they gone with two natural sitters right in front of that back three, and that allows the other front five to go and attack. So that was Ferdizoy, Watts, uh, Green. Finn and Lions are the ones that go and attack and then O'Neill and McCann are able to just back up the play and they're vital to make sure that they protect that back three. I also thought the back three didn't probably jump as much as they did in previous games where they, they, they followed the striker in a little bit but then passed them on and said, right, we're going to stay connected as a back three. Um, Fairless Farris done that really well. Which, whichever centre-back went out and engaged, they had runners in behind that one because they knew they had no wing-back on that side to maybe be the cover so um again it's distances if 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 the back line is deep then everybody has to be deep with them the front line have to drop back in the midfield have to drop back in or if there's high pressure and the line of engagement is high from the strikers the back line needs to push up behind them as well and make sure that they're, that they're high up the pitch and then Alan Manis is the one that's sweeping behind so um they're gonna have to suffer in the game Again, every good European team is going to make you suffer at some stage. And if they weather that and, and they can get through that, I think they can get a result over there. Um, the going weekend, uh, the going weekend over there would be a tough ask. But I think Stephen would be delighted if he came away with, with a draw. 
Yeah, certainly. And that would be uh, two points to start the campaign if that were to happen. But they're coming into it off the back of 5-1 win over Finn Harps in the league and a crucial one, obviously, given what's happening around them in the table and just trying and I guess that goal of trying to win the league again and then getting that route, uh, an easier route into European group stages as um, has happened uh, this season. So, uh, Ollie, on this, obviously, um, we'll talk about the Finn Harps uh, side of the equation a little bit later on because, obviously, uh, the uh, the Finn Harps manager wasn't too happy with some of the, with one of the refereeing decisions, particularly the penalty, uh, so to speak. But from a Shamrock Rovers point of view, um, you know, under a little bit of pressure, especially with Derry City winning on Friday night, uh, a crucial result for them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I say with, with everything that's going on, um, it was vital that they, they won the three points. You know, losing to to Bowles and the in the derby would have hurt them as well. But you know, bounce back with a decent European performance, but. You know they need to take care of business in the league, as you say, and they did. And uh, I think, you know, take aside even the result, huge positives of Ferrugi getting a couple of goals. He's had a really, really tough, um, you know, last year or so since he went to Rovers. So it's great to see him back, um, and hopefully he can keep going the way he's going and get back to the player we we know he can be, um, you know, and even psychologically for him to come through what he's come through. Um, and he's he's a good guy. Um, he's well liked around the, the the squad and the league. So I think everyone wants to see him do well. That was huge. Obviously, Jack Byrne getting more minutes, assists, it's incredible. I didn't realize like, ten assists, considering the amount of time and games he's missed. Like that, it's unbelievable. And to get a goal again, and look, everyone knows his quality. But you know when that stat came out last night, I heard Graham mentioning it on the on cold comms there, and um, incredible. But. Look, it just shows the, the quality he has. But for him to get more minutes and get a goal, um, that that will lift him as well. And you know, the three points is huge. It's massive, and it's it's not it's not easy. Although when we were remember with shells and we went on that European run, we had a little bit of a gap in the league. But it's tough going to keep going going to the well every time, even mentally to go. I need to go again here and get the three points. And then we need to go again in Europe. But you know, Stephen has assembled a really strong squad there. You know, and, and the lads are able to rotate around and it doesn't seem to really affect them that much. They don't feel the pressure, certainly in the league games anyway. And, uh, you know, everyone seems to be looking forward to playing and getting out on the pitch and everyone is, is seizing their chance um, when they get in there. Um, you know, Gaffney, again, last night, he's, I think he's been absolutely superb. For me, he's been the player of the year in the season so far. Um, everything he does, even so, he loses the ball. There's no lost causes. He's chasing back. He's winning it back on top of all the quality he has. He must enjoy to play with. He's got goals as well. Superb. Like, so there's loads, loads of positives for Rovers there. And so they'll, they'll be delighted after that last night. Yeah, and they are four points clear of Derry City with the game in hand as well. Dundalk, six points uh, behind Shamrock Rovers as well. And we'll talk about their defeat to UCD very, very shortly. Um, and actually, we'll just go through the results first before we get um, Ollie Horgan's uh, reaction and to the uh, to the 5-1 defeat to Shamrock Rovers from the Finn Harps point of view, which has left them bottom of the table. But Derry City, with Michael Duffy scoring an absolute peach of a goal, um, beat Bohemians 1-0 on Friday night. St. Pat's continuing their good run of form with a 2-0 win at draw to United also went down to 10 and early uh, but still got the win Sligo Rovers on the pitch at least have been in reasonable form of late and a 2-0 win at Shelburne and then as I said UCD beating Dundalk 3-2 which sort of came out of nowhere especially considering they were also 2-1 down with uh, about 10 minutes to go um, and as I said Shamrock Rovers 5 Finn Harps 1 but it was the penalty the second goal for Shamrock Rovers that Ollie Horgan was not happy about so he was talking to Ushin Langan at full time and the incident was Ryan Rainey being penalised for challenge on Aaron Green. Uh, look, five one is five one, and there's no hiding place, and you can make all the excuses in the world you want. Um, I thought we started quite well. Uh, we we conceded a poor goal. The penalty I've watched it probably now twenty times uh, without mixing my words was a disgrace. That is not why we lost the game, though. But I think it needs to be addressed. It was a disgrace, and he get a booking on top of it. And uh, to be fair to Aaron Green, who's I suppose it's easy when you're on that win inside, but with Eric Darren, he's he's always been sporting. You know, he says no, no chance. But you know, we were quite comfortable at one nil, albeit one nil. We 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 with a number of chances and numbers of pieces on the counter, and then our own fault was from the concession of the penalty at the half time. We were brutal, 
and that's nowhere near good enough. Second half, I thought we were quite good. We had the better chances probably in the second half, and OK, we scored to get back to 4-1. We had a great chance to, to get back to 4-2, and God knows what would have happened. Although, you know, we're not saying that we deserved that in the of the game. We were com- you know, comfortably beaten, comprehensively beaten. However, I still... I have to mention the penalty for the second goal. It's difficult. It's difficult for me to mention it without, you know, maybe any any loud talking or you know whatever. It's it's not good enough. And I said it to the referee, and uh, I asked him to look at it. I'm sure he will look at it. But I've no. Did he explain that. anything to you? Did you get a, a word with him afterwards? Uh, at half time, to be fair to the fourth official, I, I asked. I said, "We need to know. We need to tell our players why a player was booked and a penalty given." And he said he pushed him, but we looked at it from exactly the side of the pitch where our cameraman was at half time. There's no push. The, 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 unless he imagined it, unless he, he thought he was going to push, push and then, but uh, am I clutching at straws? At 5-1, it looks like I am. But it was a huge moment in the game at 1-0 down. We were quite comfortable. Never comfortable as in, you know, we're going to go win a game. Uh, the better side won, as I said, Oshin, and I'm not going making excuses. However, it does need to be stated that it was okay. The score before one. Well, let's put it that way. Yeah. Okay. Well, just to explain to people who haven't seen the incident, uh, Ryan Rainey and Aaron Green went up for a ball across yeah. in year box. Yeah. They came together, and th- th- the referee gave a penalty. Uh, but you, you're not entirely sure why. No idea. Okay. Because we looked at the back, and to be fair to the Shamrock Rovers mentioned, to be fair to Aaron Green, he's no idea. No, it wasn't like the ball hit the crossbar and there was a scramble. The ball went straight up in the air. It was going nowhere. You know, like, however, I don't want to take away from a very good Shamrock Rovers performance. And it's not like, oh, God, Ali, get over it. You know, we were beaten comprehensively. However, it's certainly there was a helping hand. I was saying we get into none of it anyway. I'm not. But it just is, I just think it needs to be said that maybe we weren't good enough. We certainly weren't good enough from the penalty to half time. Neil Faruja getting <laughs> down the right hand side twice and we were nowhere near it. But the referee wasn't good enough for, for the decision for the second goal either. OK, that's Finn Harps manager Ollie Horgan discussing the 5-1 win or 5-1 defeat to um, Hammer Covers. And the uh, the penalty incident obviously is sort of the, the main tenor of what he's uh, discussing there. Uh, Graham. On the decision first, before we get on to the consequences of it, which has obviously left them bottom of the table, but the the penalty decision itself, do you agree with his view on it? Um, I, I, I don't. There was contact. Rainey makes contact. I, he's on the wrong side of the, the centre forward. The centre forward is peeled off the back of the right centre back, um, Boylan, and he's uh, Boyle, Andy Boyle. He's pulled onto his shoulder. Gaffney clips it, and the right back is on the way in. Um, and he's out of position originally, but he's, he's coming in to head it. But he goes with his right arm. The goal, to me, if he's trying to head it, he goes, his left arm should lead, and he goes with his right arm, and then his right arm extends and pushes Green, like makes contact with Green. Green's off balance as he's heading the back, so any type of nudge is going to push him over because he's, he's jumped off his back foot to try and head it back across goal. Um, and then what's happened is I think he's just... Ex- I think it's the extra extension of his arm that the referee sees, and that's why he gives the penalty. At the time, I thought it was because I just thought there was no need for the extra extension of the arm. Now, if Greener's gotten up and Greener's been probably just trying to be likable with Ollie and say, "Ah, no, it wasn't a penalty," but it's five one. I'm pretty sure if it was if it was two one, Green would say, "Yeah, it's a definite penalty." His arm. So, um, but I understand Ollie's frustration in that it was a vital time in the game, but. Again, Finn Harps just weren't at the races yesterday. He just weren't. He just couldn't get close enough to Rovers to make an impact. If he's annoyed with the decisions, I think there's going to be worse decisions uh, that have happened in the league that's cost his team more um, throughout the season than this one. But he obviously has to try and um, protect his players and and maybe deflect away from the fact that um, they lost five one, but they've got bigger games and more important games coming up. In this scenario, lads, uh, I reckon you know. It's really hitting the business end of the season now with, with UCD winning on Friday night as well. It's putting big pressure. Maybe all he's thinking, I need a bit of, you know, get a bit of vocal out there, get get a bit of, you know, momentum going with the team, a little bit of a siege mentality. Then perhaps a few a few of these 50-50 decisions may be in referees' minds. Oh, here's Ollie again, be calling me out if I don't, you know, so you might get you might get a, a decision here between here and the end of the season, but but 
by playing a few a few mind games. Um, as, as he said, it was the penalty wasn't the reason they lost uh, uh, to, to Rovers. So you know he's, he really is thinking about that running now because it's 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 a two horse race for just just for a playoff now at this stage. Yeah, most certainly. Um, as I said, UCD's uh, three two, two win against Dundalk, which I think given where the scoreline was at at 80 minutes, 2-1 uh, down to a very good Dundalk side, you kind of thought, OK, that's uh, that's over. But then uh, Dylan Duffy with the equaliser and then Tommy Lonergan with the uh, with the winner at the end, which completes the brace, uh, Ollie, I mean... Um, you can you can sense Ollie Horgan's frustration there, which was obviously coming a couple of days after uh, after that UCD win. But um, you know, I would have said like they're not you know these type teams they're not going to live or die against result uh, via results against like Shamrock Rovers or Dundalk. But then UCD show again, you can throw a spanner in the works. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I probably agree with Ed there. Is and maybe Ollie is looking for try and get any little advantage or edge he can coming into the remaining few games. You know, if, like. A decision here or there goes his way it could be the difference between being bottom or, or getting into that playoff spot and yeah look UCD what a win as you say after I have 78 79 minutes you're thinking Dundalk are strong enough defensively as well and you're thinking now oh, they'll they'll see this out and they might even score a third but for them to come back to, to nick that win 3-2 a couple of great finishes as well to to win it and um, Duffy controls with his left switches on to his right and buries it in the far corner and Lonergan as well goes around the keeper and you think, oh, it's a bit tight now and he buries it as well. So it was it's a great win for for UCD and you know they'll get huge confidence from that as well. <clears throat> um, but it's yeah, it's it's keeping the pressure on on Ollie. I know they've been the great escape artist over the last number of years. He's done an unbelievable job keeping him in the in the Premier Division. But you know maybe there's only so many times you you can keep doing that. But look, there's still there's only a point in it. Still a few games to play for. So um, and as I say, look, Ollie's probably looking for any little edge or any little boost he can get to give the players going into the running, but it's going to be really interesting to see how it pans out now and say UCD will be full of confidence after that win. Yeah, it's far from over. He's at one point. It'd be interesting to, just, it. be interesting just to get Graham's uh, take on the, the commentary for the winning goal in that UCD game. Um, obviously, there's a lot being said this year about the League of Ireland uh, matches and a certain amount of bias coming through in the, co- in the commentaries, which a lot of fans <laughs> like, you know, some clubs a lot more evident than others, but uh, Peter Peter Brannigan was one, was one of our colleagues and he was commentating on that game. He's one of the very, very few UCD fans in Dublin, you know, and obviously he would try and keep a professional element to his commentary, but he did get a bit uh, excited for that one. I'm sure you can uh, appreciate that, Graham. I was, uh, I was, um, yeah, because, I was. I had to go and be very impartial last uh, on Thursday for the game, and then last night you go back to League of Ireland TV and it becomes different. But do you know what? Like when the likes of UCD and Finn Harps are winning, and and the the, the home commentators are commenting on it, they're, they're gonna get excited. Like they've, I think they've they've only got four wins each this season. So when they do come along, you can't you can't blame them for getting involved and being excited in it. A wonderful goal. I know Stevie O'Donnell has come out since. Yeah, Stevie O'Donnell has come out since and said like, um, he's like he's not overly concerned about the high line, but it's more you'd be concerned about pace. That's what seems to be hurting them at the minute. Dylan Duffy's pace hurts them, and so does um, and then you see Tommy Lonergan's pace that hurts them as well for the last two goals. So it's a fantastic result. UCD have been excellent in fairness. Andy Moyle has done a terrific job there. He's brought in some new players. Um, some young players they're hungry they're powerful and they're willing to run and um, because Dundalk it's, Dundalk's away form has been shocking and it's really cost them um, probably challenging for the title this season yeah, uh, they're six points uh, down on Shamrock Rovers and having played two games more and also saying Pats now sort of breathing down their neck. We'll talk about Pats and their really good form very, very shortly. But uh, first off, let's listen to the uh, post-match interviews after Derry City versus Bohemians with Michael Duffy's uh, Michael Duffy's winner, which was excellent. And we'll uh, if you're watching it on YouTube, you'll be able to see it. His winner deciding it and also bringing them closer initially to uh, to Shamrock Rovers. But uh, let's listen to Michael Duffy anyway, discussing that goal and also his manager, Rory Higgins, afterwards. Um, uh, that one's definitely up there. Um, just because I've been thinking about that moment for a long time since I signed, no celebrating that side in front of the fans and I felt brilliant. Didn't decide to take a touch at all. You just unleashed it and it in off the pulse of beauty. 
Uh, the ball was bouncing towards me. I was thinking I'm taking a touch and just changing my mind last minute and look at it went down. It's a big win for Derry City in the context of the league, given that Dundalk lost tonight your former club. Uh, big time. Uh, we just have to focus on ourselves and we just move on to Tuesday. Now. It was a massive one for us. Special, special goal from a special player. Um, it's, it's the side of the match. Let's be honest. I don't think it was. A, I don't think it was a brilliant game of football. Uh, we didn't pass the ball the way that we can, but we looked threatening on the counter attack. And I think, um, aye, listen. I, I don't think a month or two ago we would have won that game. I think we've shown a side to us tonight where it wasn't overly pleasing on the eye, but we we stuck at it and we dug in. And, and to be fair, Brian Maher's made a big save as well at one 0 and, and kept us in the game. But um, they didn't create an awful lot, but we were resolute and 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 uh, we stuck in there. Obviously, the goal and uh, obviously the result we'll discuss uh, very very shortly. But Ed, um, obviously you were kind of you were covering this game for RT Sport online on the night as well. But it was very much coloured by the injury to Kieran Call at the beginning, and it's good to see that at least like he's been discharged from hospital and uh, hopefully on the on the road to recovery. Absolutely, and you know when. Um... When television doesn't replay the incident, you know it's it's serious. So I recall it in in real time, and he fell from a, a big height. And when you're landing on that pitch, especially, it's that bit harder than than a grass pitch, as well. And he 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 just didn't get any hand down either side of him to to help break the fall. So it was certainly concerning, but you could sort of tell. Well, I'm no expert, but it didn't look as though it was neck or head serious. You know, obviously the back was. Was, was still in play but yeah but thankfully uh, all seems to be certainly positive from that front um, I'd agree with uh, Rory there it certainly wasn't a good game it was it was pretty poor to be honest with you and from a team with title uh, uh, aspirations it's not it's not good enough however you know they've won a game ugly and they've they put big pressure on Rovers there on Friday night you know to get that close I just think they'll probably run out of games in the end um, because they are getting those results and they are a formidable unit. You know, they always cause Rovers problems and uh, I fully expect them to do that in the in the, in the the next game they play as, and as well as the cup match. But um, I, I think, as, as again, what Rory said, uh, Brian Maher deserves special praise for his performance on Friday night. I've not always been his biggest fan um, and he's not the tallest of goalkeepers, but he was exceptional uh, just in his handling on a, on Friday night. And then to make the vital save as well kept uh, kept the pressure on on Rovers as a result. Yeah, that that save on um, from Ethan Varian's shot, um, which I think is the one you're referring to. There it was a real a proper reflex save, um, low down to his left. But um, the goal, Ali Hal, um, you know, as as Ed said, there it wasn't the greatest of games. Probably impacted by the injury, both sides being impacted by what they saw, but. Um, it was a superb finish by Michael Duffy and a player who's been kind of missed for a good chunk of the season by Derry. Yeah, yeah. Special goal from a, from a special player, really. You, say, you, you think, I'll oh, just take a touch in it, but he just he took a step back. He's just judged the way the ball's come. And when he hit it, his keeper's just looking at it. And he's destined for the top corner. It was some strike. And I think you see what it means to him as well in his interview after, um, you know, going back to Derry and, uh, you know, obviously the disappointment with the injury, but, Derry will be absolutely delighted to have him back for the running uh, if he's firing on all cylinders I know he probably still needs more games and stuff as well to really get up to speed but if they have him back anywhere near his best for the running it's it's a huge um, plus for them and um, that's three games on the bounce I think Rory alluded to it there as well maybe you know a month or two ago they might have lost it when they were going through that patchy spell but they've grounded out and they that can galvanise teams you know wins like that where you dig in and you know, I said Brian Maher to save and stuff, they can go the other way. But when you come out with that 1 0 win, especially this crucial period of the, of the season, you know, it can, it can really gain momentum from it. But again, yeah, ultimately, I think they'll, they'll just fall short um, of it. But look, to have Michael Duffy, I think for everyone in the league, to have Michael Duffy back playing at his best is, is good for everyone. Everyone wants to see him do his stuff. And I said that was, that was an unbelievable goal from him. Yeah, which probably makes the the cup game, the cup quarter final against Shamrock Rovers this Sunday all the more important. Like we've got it live on RT two and the RT player, and obviously, if Derry City were to fall short in the league, obviously the FAI Cup would be something they're uh, definitely targeting, especially with a couple of other big hitters having um, 
been knocked out already, namely St. Pat's, we will talk about, and also Cycle Rovers. But one thing, um, Graham, that I did want to bring up in regards to Derry City, we, we talked a lot about Jamie McGonagall at the start of the season, 10 league goals um, in the first half of the season, but then he's now gone like the la- his last 10 league games without a goal, and he's had fewer minutes as well. They really need him to sort of recapture that form from the start of the season. Yeah, they do. Like you said, I think, they've, in fairness, they've scored... They've scored more goals than any other team in the league. I think they've scored 47, which is the highest for any other team in the league. So the, the goals have obviously started coming from elsewhere. And that's probably why, you know, there was so much probably onus on him at the start of the season. And now everyone else seems to be chipping in with more goals. And maybe Rory just decides just to take him out of the line and give him a break, probably just mentally from that side of it as well. But... um again, he just needs to get his confidence back in front of goal. Um, it's a hard one from a, from a striker's point of view. It's something that I struggle to understand or relate to because um, obviously the centre-forwards are a different breed. They, 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 they feel they're judged on goals and if they, they could play well in a game and if they don't score, they're still frustrated with it. So, um, But he has been, like you said, it, over the season, he's been excellent for them and he just needs to get that little bit of confidence back into his game. And But like, I, I agree with Ollie a little bit. Like, And, and it, sometimes them one nails when you don't play that well are great when you're trying to build something and because it shows that they're able to keep a clean sheet in the game and that clean sheet can then spread confidence throughout the team that all you need is one goal to win the game. And that's where you see it, where it takes a moment of magic to unlock balls, but then they go and keep a clean sheet and, and, and go on. But they're, um, they're what, these six points, but they're four points behind. The Rovers have a game at hand. Rovers have never beaten Derry in the FAI Cup. That's um, something they've never done. It's the one team that they've never beaten. And to go away from home and beat them up there, it's a big ass for Rovers. But it makes for a cracking game, I feel now. Um, Derry and Rovers games this season have been really good technically and, both, and tactically. They've both been excellent games. So it'd be interesting to see that one next week because that's one we're really looking forward to. Yeah, and then also same. That's Pats. another staff for you there, Alza. I have a new stack <laughs> guy. I have a new stack guy. <laughs> Someone in your ear there, is there all the time? Yeah, I have a new one. I need one of them in my ear. He is. I have, a, I have a new one that just comes in every now and then, but feeds them to me. <laughs> yeah, another another stat, uh, which uh, is well worth keeping an eye on, of course, the same Pats now, five wins in a row um, after beating Drada United 2-0. Mm-hmm. And obviously they went down early to 10 men with Anto Breslin getting sent off, but still found a way through. And Oli, looking at their form as well, it's all come since the second leg against CSK Sofia, which, you know, they performed well over the two legs. And unfortunately then, uh, I think we discussed on the time, there were some refereeing decisions and then just some little mistakes here and there that cost them in that particular leg. But in the league, um, uh, Tim Tim Clancy has found a, a a system that's really worked, and more often than not, not in every game, but in most most times, they've they've lent on this three five two with wing backs with Barry Cotter, who actually didn't start uh, against Strada, and Andrew Breslin on the other side, and then Atakai as part of a front two, and then Tyce Timmermans is often played as part of that midfield, and they seem to have found some level of consistency that wasn't there at the start of the season. Yeah, to, again, to be running into this sort of form at this stage of the season is huge. And as you say, even though they, they lost that European tie, ultimately, they've gained a lot of confidence from it, going away, winning away, um, home, you know, playing well, a couple of decisions go against them. If, if they went the other way, you know, it's different. And they've probably looked at it and gone, do you know what, we're we're a good team and we've, we've Let's let's build on this and on, on these performances. And as you say, they've, they've brought that into the league, five, five wins on the bounce, up to draw, they're not an easy place as well. They've done well and up there down to 10 men, but it just shows you say that they're probably their headspace and mentally where they're at at the moment. Um, and to come out with there with, with a 2 0 win, um, it's great for them. And again, you're looking at Dundalk, who's in you know, Pats are going in the right direction and the, the momentum swing there, um, could be huge. And I'm sure Pats will be eyeing up that, definitely looking at third spot and getting ahead of Dundalk and, and they've a game in hand. So they could they could pull away further, like you know. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it's all to play for. It's all to play for again there. So it's um, yeah, yeah. It's massive. Uh, the momentum, as you say, any team with a bit of momentum at this stage of the season is, you know, it it's huge. It's it's huge for them. And um, you know, they say Forrester getting the goal as well. Doyle back in in Drada getting the goal as well. So you know, it's all positives for them at the moment. 
You yeah. ever want to go down to 10 men on any pitch, it's up and dry, isn't it, Alder? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's tight enough there, yeah, to be able to... to <laughs> You've had to, to do get, that a few compact. times. Stay, stay compact, yeah. <laughs> you've had to get a you have to get a few results there with 10 men in your day, Alder. No <laughs> thanks, no thanks to no thanks to myself. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> when we talk about momentum, Sligo Rovers have a little bit of a um three three wins on the and I say on the pitch because obviously there's a uh, the first uh, the first then this is since the uh three two uh three two defeat of Finn Harp. So the first game obviously there was an issue with an ineligible player, so doesn't really count. And Dundalk got, uh, ended up subsequently getting all three points, but they've then with two clean sheets again in their next two games have uh you know they they've started to pick up points, but. Graham, it's kind of come a little bit too late for them. It shows great mental fortitude from them to actually uh, go to, go away to Shelbourne and win after actually losing the three points as well, because that must have been a blow to them. Um, and like you said, they were building that momentum to go and try and challenge. But uh, Johnny Russell's done a really good job since he's gone in there. Uh, last year, they, they suffered badly from a European hangover. Um, after Europe, after he got knocked out of Europe, he just couldn't get a string of results going at all. But this year, he seemed to have obviously picked back up. And it's something that he probably needed to do and that he should become a little bit more mentally resilient. Um, and and they've done that. And to go away to Shelbourne, who are the difficult side to play, um, their home record probably isn't something that they, they need, probably need to win more home games at Talca Park. But... Uh, for Sligo to go there and keep a clean sheet and also then score two goals it's a great result for Sligo and for Johnny Russell and it shows a little bit of mental strength in the squad yeah, from the Shelburne point of view, Ollie, um, you know, it's a, it's, it'll end up being a solid season as a promoted club to, you know, to to stay up. That's the first goal. But, um, speaking of goals, though, they're they probably haven't converted as many as they would have liked over the season. Uh, they haven't scored in the last three games, and uh, they've only scored twenty five for the season. And the only club who scored fewer and um, this season is UCD. So that's an area, I guess, for Damien Duff. Uh, for the run-in and also for the uh, for next season and beyond, that's one area where they'll just like look to either solve that through the transfer market or to find a better balance within the team. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure Damien after the match was disappointed um, in his in his post-match interview and more so I think on the goals they conceded um, the other night, two poor goals defensively from them. I think Luke Bourne missing is, is big for them and obviously Conor Kane is, is a huge is a huge loss as well. But I think, as you said there, overall, you'd probably look at it as going good, solid. So, you know, new manager, first season in, lots of new players in, um, plenty of positives, lots lots to build on, some some good players there. And I thought start of the season, the likes of Jack Moylan and all was was really flying. Um, but as you say, maybe just not enough goals. Um, and I'm sure they'll, they'll look to address that. But, you know, I, th- I think looking at them overall, as you say, like consolidate, staying up and um, which they've done that comfortably um, and look to build on it um, and you know I, I think I think they've done a really good job there and just the way the team seems to want to play for him and he gets the most out of them um, and he's trying to play I know they make a couple of mistakes playing out but you know, when you're going to play that way and especially with some younger players that, that's going to happen and it looks like they've given them the confidence to, to do that and play um, that way which is which is great and and, and they've taken it on as well so um, yeah, look, pl- plenty of positives. Obviously, disappointed with with the result, and as I say he was more I think disappointed with the conceding the goals the way they did. But um, you know, hopefully, they can grab a few wins before towards the end of the season now and, and look to build on that for next season. Yeah, and there's one game midweek as well, which is tomorrow, Derry City against Sligo Rovers at the Ryan McBride Brandywell Stadium, 7.45 kickoff. Uh, but in the first division, I think there is a sort of conclusive feel to uh, Friday night's action. So Cork City winning 2-1 at Waterford, Treaty United beating Bray Wanderers 2-1, Cove Ramblers uh, holding Galway United to a 1-1 draw and Athlone Town beating Wexford 2-0. So what that does to the table, Cork City now 10 points clear of Galway, uh, Galway having a game in hand also Waterford who are 15 points down on Cork but also having a game in hand and uh, down at the bottom then at Lone Town and Cove Ramblers now level on points on 14 but at the top end of it Graham um, Cork City obviously it's a huge win for them but with time running out in the season you kind of feel like they definitely have more than one foot in the uh, in that automatic promotion place and we'll be seeing them in the in the Premier Division next season one hand on the trophy you I'd say Cork at this stage probably um, 
yeah, I was. We were down there last week playing a game in the in the in the youth uh, league. I was talking to Colin Healy, and he's quite a calm um, manager, and just having a chat and saying like, been a good season for him. He says, yeah, and they've just shown a lot more consistency and maturity in the squad. But um, Galway have probably too many draws have killed Galway this year. Where you can see with the last minute goal, the Cork. I think it's the last minute penalty Cork score, and that's where. To sign the champions is making sure that they win games when they're instead of them fittering out to, to a draw that they're finding a way to win games and it's something that Cork have done this season and full credit to Colin Healy because it was a tough year from last year they were down around the bottom and to, to make the jump he's made from finishing where he did last year to, to basically champions elect this season um, it's fantastic and he's done a wonderful job and it'd be great to see Cork and, and back in the Premier Division because I do feel that the league does need more teams like Cork, like Galway's that are from different areas of the country and Cork have always been a massive team. Um, Ollie will tell you that before he jumped ship and legged on them but they were, um, they're a massive club like, you know, um, and I'm surprised he left them anyway but they are, they're a big, they're a big club and, and, it's, and it means a lot to the city down there. Yeah, and uh, one other thing I think to look out for, like obviously Galway at this point by the one draw, but the the Cove Ramblers goal in that game, um, Ed, I think you might have uh, spotted a little bit of this on Friday night, the Daniel O'Connell goal from about halfway. You've got to ask the keeper questions yeah. about this position for that one. Though. There was a lot of time in the air like, and there was uh, there was no reason for him not to get to that really, but uh, great to see those ones flying all the same. Yeah, certainly. And in the Women's National League, Shelburne and Peamount, uh, that was good. that was a huge game. I was watching on TG Cower on um, on Saturday on Saturday evening, and there was a little bit riding on this in terms of Peamount trying to at least keep themselves in within uh, a shot of trying to you know give themselves a chance of winning the title. And Shelburne obviously at the top, but Peamount won one nil. Stephanie Roach scoring from close range, and coupled with that, Wexford on the same night beating Cork City 5-1. So Wexford now go top of the table. It was a tight game between Shelburne and Peamount. Not a lot in it, although I felt Peamount shaded that first half um, before then uh, the game kind of balanced up. But the end result anyway is that uh, P-Mount moved within six points of, or sorry, six points at the top, but obviously at the top, Wexford going, uh, you know, Wexford changing the scene now, because I think a few weeks ago we were talking about Shelburne running away with it. And now, you know, we've got a, a proper run in now. Yeah, for sure. And, and look, the more teams involved in it, you know, the more, interest that builds up on it and in terms of player distribution and stuff it, it, it's a great way of keeping all you know competitive competitive league but the, the players aren't just looking to get to one team they're not just looking to get to Shelburne and not looking to get to, to Piment or whatever else but and the fact of the matter is now there's there's places up for grabs in the international squad as well as that you know and you see the likes of Stephanie Roach and you know some people might have written her off but she's, she's still knocking on the door as well and there's, you know, it's it's a uh, it's 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 all good for the health of the game, and I, I think, you know, you'd imagine the shells would probably still come out on top of it all, but um, it, it's at least we've got an exciting sort of uh, run into it. Yeah, and um, certainly credit to Wexford for um, for staying in the battle as well. And they're playing Treaty United, who have only drawn one game and lost every other game they've played. So they have a good chance of getting three points there. And then Shelburne are the very good at lone uh, town team on Saturday and then P-Mount hosting Sligo as well. So there's a, you know, it's something to keep, definitely keep an eye on over the next wee while. But also one thing that we are keeping an eye on, of course, is Galway WFC, who decided to step away from uh, the SSE or Tristy League, Women's National League uh, for 2023. But the way it looks like, it looks like Galway United are going to step in and take their place. Yeah, it does. It sounds like that is part of the bigger Galway United project by the sound of it, um, which, you know, you don't want to hear about teams leaving the league, but if it means a stronger, more united, no pun intended, Galway coming back into it, uh, it's probably a good thing. I think women's teams being part of of the official club, whether it's Shamrock Rovers, Bohemians, these sort of things, I think I think they just get a better, um, I suppose it's just a better feeling to the team and you're much more part of the whole culture of the club and the, a lot of doors open because of it, you know, better training facilities, better home pitches and stuff. So 
I imagine the conversation was had down in Galway in relation to what was the best approach to take to it. And I would say, judging by what was going on in Galway in the last 12 months, that being part of Galway United is good for their brand and also good for the good for the city and good for the region for, for women's football. Yeah, and it keeps senior football out west as well, which I think is the uh, the other important part of it as well, um, especially with the league looking to expand over the next few years as well. But uh, finally, before we go, um, we've got we're going to have live coverage of Liverpool against Ajax on RT two and the RT player on Tuesday night, and this is obviously coming back off the back of last Wednesday's four one defeat to Napoli for Jurgen Klopp's side. Now they had a match postponed against Wolves at the weekend, so we didn't see how they were going to how they're going to bounce back, but. Uh, um, Graham, there's been a lot of focus on the defensive side, especially, you know, you were talking about high lines there earlier and Liverpool ha- under Jurgen Klopp, that's the system that they played, a very high line, but also the importance of pressing from the front and that seemed to desert them against Napoli and at other times this season as well. Yeah, and I think Klopp said afterwards, if you, it's not that the high line is the problem, it's that there's no pressure on the ball, but as a defender, it, listen, because I wasn't blessed with a great pace. If there was no pressure on the ball, I wasn't. I wasn't going high. No chance. There's two reasons you. There's two reasons you can play a high line. One is if there's pressure on the ball, and the second one if there's no threat over the top. But Napoli had Napoli had both. Napoli had threats over the top and down the sides, and the and the, and they didn't have pressure on them, so that they're, they're able to play it um, and and play the passes they wanted and and be more accurate with them because of that lack of pressure. But there's no continuity in the back line, and that that they're a little bit um they're not connected enough. They're not following when players play little one twos and things, which is a worry as well that I seen. Um, I understand when it's higher up the pitch that the closest player goes and presses the ball. So if my man ha- if 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 I'm defending and my man plays one back, I, I can release off my man and expect the next man to come up and do mine. But when a player's playing a one two around the back. You have no one behind you to actually take take that man, so you actually have to stay with your with your one two and just get a block in. I didn't see that enough. Um, so the lack of um, intensity in the defending and it, it's worrying, but the lack of connectivity all over the pitch is a bit worrying as well. Like we said, if if you're gonna be deep, everyone's deep, and you defend as a team and you make them play backwards. Liverpool always had that where they they got people behind the ball and then reset that press. They're not doing that enough neither. So if you do break them out, their recovery runs are really good. They recover across diagonally across the pitch. That's not happening. Um, so th- they're getting waves of pressure. And, and once teams are in on them, it's like they're in on goal, which is worrying. Allison has the most saves in one-on-one contests um, for the whole of last season. And, and to me, as a defender, I'd be a bit embarrassed by that if, if my keeper is having to make that many saves to bail me out. Um, but Klopp needs to fix the, the high press if he's going to do it. And if the, if he doesn't fix that, he maybe need to drop into a, into a, a bit of a lower block, um, maybe even a medium block at some stage, because the, obviously Van Dijk still does have pace and Gomez and, and Matip do have pace to recover, but they're not they're just not connected enough as a team at the minute. Yeah, and Klopp has talked about the idea of reinvention, um, which he said uh, directly after the, the Napoli game. But uh, a final point, uh, uh, Oli, the, um, obviously the, there's been injuries and they've had something like five different midfield combinations this season so far, which obviously doesn't help with cohesion and then trying to press effectively. But beyond the beyond the injuries, when you look at some of the key individuals, and there's been a lot of focus on the likes of Virgil van Dijk's form, on Trent Alexander-Arnold, um, and then a couple of players, and a couple of players in midfield and uh, further forward when you look at them do you feel it's a um, there's a little bit of a hangover from the the you know the pressures of the way that last season ended or is it just something it does it feel fairly temporary to you yeah I suppose given the quality of the players you're probably seeing as feel like it's it's temporary but I think some even Salah maybe since he came back from the Africa Cup of Nations and his form has been poor like it's like I mentioned earlier, it's hard to keep going to the well all the time. And that intensity in the way Klopp wants them to play, it's it's really difficult. I suppose, you know, they've had a, a few years of success doing it now to keep going. And so it's the biggest thing for me looking at them is is that intensity, that will and that want to defend. Yeah, you know, they say it's whatever about pressing up the pitch, but when teams are getting in, the United goal, Sancho's goal, and some of the, the play against Napoli as well, going 
like defenders are stationary nearly watching guys running off them and you know you have to have that intensity and that desire to defend and, and stop goals going in and um, that can lift teams just as much as scoring goals the other end as well so um, but again look I say you're still looking at the quality that they have you, you'd like to think it'll be temporary probably having the game off um, I think on Saturday or so whenever they're due to play was probably a positive for them Klopp has an extra few days to you know to work to iron out um, what they need to iron out and you'd expect a, a huge reaction um, from them against Ajax. Ajax obviously had a good win first day out and they, they'll be decent so it's going to be a really interesting game I can't wait to see but so me being a United fan, I'm on the opposite end now with United, how poor they were. You know, this season now you were just looking for a bit of intensity, a bit of will to win and get stuck in, and, and they're getting that. Whereas Liverpool seem to have got a bit of what United have had over the last number of years, where that that will and that intensity is is down at the moment. And um the running stats are down, aren't they, Ollie? Like when you when you consider they play, they, they competed in every game. That was possible last season. You got to the yeah. final of every game. The the the, the league tight was on the line right up to the last season. The break was shorter because the World Cup came in, and then it's very hard to then go right. We're gonna go and play at that same intensity again. It's so a tough it's thing to ask. Like. To keep doing that and to keep it at yeah. that level for it. and it's, it's how many years there now that and a clock and that's the way he wants to play. But as Raf say, maybe to reinvent or maybe might have to tweak it here and there. But you know, they need to do something. Yeah. yeah. And we'll see on Tuesday night when Liverpool take on Ajax, as said, live on RT2 and the RT player. But uh, that's it for this week. Ed Leahy, thanks Mill for uh, coming on this week. And Oli Cahill and Graham Gartland as well. Not a Stetson in sight, so uh, no, no, no complaints Loads there. of stats, but no Stetsons. Country <laughs> FM, me and Alza used to listen in the car. He loved it. <laughs> Fair enough. Anyway, best of luck, everyone, and we'll be, we'll be back next week. 